So you guys ready to get into the scriptures? Yeah? All right. Sorry. Let's go ahead and finish up this series on Marriage 2.0. And I hope that, I'm sure it's been encouraging. God is a God of miracles. And so, you know, in light of this testimony that we heard, here's how we're going to close out this series. We're going to talk about the importance, and this is, seems super simple, but m- folks, it, 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 it's such a powerful principle, and we're going to see it in, in several verses here. But that principle is just don't give up. I mean, if we were to title our talk today, I would title it Going the Distance in Marriage. That one of the most powerful things that we can do is just not give up. Now, of course, uh, this testimony, the, the God, Gonzalez, is they, they gave up, but they really ultimately didn't give up. And God did a miracle. And I'm just convinced that there's something powerful, something supernatural that happens when we choose simply not to quit. Now, I know it takes both husband and wife to make that decision. But I think that's a powerful, if, if anybody's going to be married, Bonnie and I have been married for 36 years. Isn't that right? 36? 36 years. I know that was bad, right? Um, bad example. 36 years, because to me it just seems like we just got married yesterday. See, how I, see what I did there? See what I did there? Guys, are you paying attention? That was pretty awesome. All right, so, but saying that was awesome just ruined it. So I just, I'm back at zero again. But, um, but if you're going to be married for 36 years, I guarantee you, if you're going to go the distance in your marriage, there are going to be multitudes, loads of time, tons of time for you and I, for Bonnie and I, it was tons of time for us to make the decision, we're not going to quit on God, on each other, on this marriage We're going to stay locked in. This thing's going to work. We're going to seek God. But one thing we're not going to do, we may argue, we may fight, but we're not going to quit. Y'all hearing what I'm saying? Something powerful in that. I want to talk about that for a little bit. You know, there's a a father, he was trying to get this whole idea across to his son, uh, who was just kind of wanting to give up on some things he was doing uh, in, in life, you know. And so he said, son, you got to hang in there. You got to remember, just don't quit. Don't quit. He says, look at Abraham Lincoln. He didn't quit. He says, look at Thomas Edison, all the experiments he did, 80,000. He didn't quit. He said, look at Douglas MacArthur. He didn't quit. He came back. He didn't quit. And then he, says, he finally said, look at Ralph Chandler. And his son says, whoa, wait a minute. Who's Ralph Chandler? He said, see, there, the guy quit. Nobody knows who he is. <laughs> that was pretty good. So we don't want to be that unknown person. We- We want our marriages, our lives to be memorable. We just can't quit. So let's take a look at some things here that are really a part of that process. And I think it's important for us to understand. And that's this. Number one, number one, anytime we're involved in anything, whether it's a marriage, whether it's an endeavor, whether it's a career or jobs, whatever it might be, here's an important point to remember. Halfway through is usually when it's the toughest. Halfway through, and if you're married for a long time, 40 years, 50 years, whatever, there's a lot of times where you feel like you're halfway through. So it's in those periods of time where you feel like, man, we're working on this thing, we're, we're almost halfway through this. There's this initial exuberance and enthusiasm and energy, and then we get about halfway through, right? It's like a project at home. Man, I'm going to redo the whole kitchen, Right? And boy, you start coming out of the blocks fast and strong. And about halfway through, you're like, what have I gotten myself into? Is that not true? The same thing with a marriage. You start off, they got the honeymoon. We're loping through the wheat fields. This is wonderful. And about halfway through, we look at each other and go, what have we gotten ourselves into? I mean, this is not... That, you know, let me give you a, a, an example from the scriptures. We've talked about this before, about Nehemiah. In the Bible, there was a time where Nehemiah wanted to restore the dignity and honor to the children of Israel. And, 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 and Nehemiah knew that, that God's heart was for the children of Israel to begin to experience that sense of dignity once again and honor as a people was to rebuild the walls that surrounded Jerusalem because they lay in ruins, the Bible says. And so Nehemiah had this vision. He rallied the people. They got excited about it. They go, yeah, we can do this. And so they're, they're in the process. They're meeting some adversity here and there. But boy, they're coming out. They've got a lot of energy. But here's what it says in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6. At, the, at last, the wall was completed to half its height. They were halfway through. 
uh, so they're halfway through around the, the entire city. For the people had worked with enthusiasm. But then if you jump down a few verses in that same chapter, here's what it says. Then the people of Judah began to complain, saying, the workers are getting tired. There's so much rubble to be moved. We'll never be able to build the wall by ourselves. So all of a sudden, they're, at one point, they're excited. They get halfway through. They see what they're facing. They get tired. They're dealing with some additional challenges, maybe some setbacks. And they go from being excited about it to thinking, wait a minute, man. Listen, starting a marriage is easy. Finishing a marriage takes a special kind of strength and courage. Anybody can start, ladies and gentlemen. Few people can finish. But it's usually halfway through that we start running out of steam. It's halfway through that we begin to look at the minutia of what we're dealing with in our marriages and we lose sight of the overall vision. I used this example once before about a city that was facing some flood waters, and so the townspeople rallied together. They began to, they, they, they figured out one of the ways that they could help save their city was to, to build their own dam full of bags of sand piled on top of each other. So everybody, moms and dads and kids, everybody was filling bags with sand and stacking these bags to try to push back or hold back the floodwaters. And they got about halfway through and they were tired. Uh, the initial energy that they had began to wane. Uh, and here's what they ended up seeing. All they ended up seeing was just empty bags that needed sand. How much more they needed to do. How much more they needed to go. And all of a sudden they lost their vision of what they were really doing. And what they felt like they were doing was just filling bags with sand. That's not very inspiring. And it's easy to quit if that's all we see we're doing is filling bags with sand. What they forgot was they weren't just filling bags with sand. They were actually saving a city. And so in our marriages, we get about halfway through. We're 10, month, 10 years into the marriage. We're two years into the marriage. We're one year. Whatever that breaking point is for us. And all we begin to see are the challenges. All we see are the problems. All we see are the disagreements, the conflicts, the things we don't agree about. All we begin to see are the weaknesses in our spouse. And we start losing strength about halfway through. And we forget. It feels like all we're doing in our marriages is filling bags with sand. And we forget what we're really doing. We're really establishing a, a marriage, a partnership, something that's powerful that will be a testimony of God's grace and God's goodness. Does that make sense, everybody? It's like, it's like the Gonzales is getting married again. God was able then to salvage what took place in that marriage and use the marriage today for what he always originally had for the purpose of their marriage. And that was this, to be a testimony of the goodness and the greatness of God. See, that's the ultimate purpose in the, for marriages anyway in God's heart and mind. Sure, he loves the fact that, it, that it's companionship for us. He loves the fact that it, that it translates into children and families. God loves that. He loves that we love that. But listen, folks, we cannot see the ultimate purpose of our marriages just curing loneliness. If we feel like that's the ultimate purpose of our marriage, when we get halfway through, we're going to quit. We're going to give up. If we feel like the ultimate purpose of our marriage is just to, just to have children, then that's not, that's not enough to keep folks married when it's tough. You quit. Are you hearing what I'm saying, right? We have to realize that the purpose of marriage in the heart of God is not just a cure for loneliness. It's not just for companionship. It's great. It's not just to produce children. That's wonderful. They are a blessing of the Lord most of the time, right? But the ultimate purpose of marriage is God's idea of it was he wanted a physical, tangible relationship that reflected the most sacred of all relationships, the relationship we have with him, him being our, Jesus being our groom, we being his bride. Does this make sense, everybody? And so to not quit, to just not give up, first of all, we need to realize that the desire, the temptation to do that, it's usually halfway through. That's when it's the toughest. Here's the second thing for us, I think, to realize if we're not going to quit, if we're going to go the distance in our marriage, we have to understand this, is that difficulty 
doesn't mean defeat. Difficulty doesn't always equal defeat. And I'll go on to say this, that defeat or maybe losing a battle doesn't mean you've lost the war. Defeat in and of itself is not terminal either. But difficulty in the marriage doesn't mean we're losing. Difficulty in the relationship doesn't mean we're losing. Here's what it says in Proverbs 24. It says, no matter how often, an hon- how often honest men fall, they always get up again. But disaster destroys the wicked. Uh, give me this. Uh, this is a better translation. Proverbs 24. Hold that up there. The godly may trip or one first says fall down seven times. No, they're not. It's not just seven. It's just they may fall down over and over and over again. But one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. See, the righteous fall down seven times, but they get up. But one disaster is enough to destroy the wicked. In other words, the writer here is saying that that everybody falls down. Everybody experiences difficulty. Everybody might find themselves in a disaster, but it's the righteous. Those who have a relationship with God, they understand that just falling down doesn't mean they've lost. They've not lost. They're only lost if they stay down. The righteous don't stay down. The wicked don't have anywhere to put their faith, their fear, their, their anger, their resentment. We, the righteous, we know where to put hope, the hopelessness and disappointment. We put it toward God. So it doesn't matter how many times we fall down, we get back up because difficulty doesn't equal defeat. This is, you see what I'm saying? There's something about us in our marriages, if we're, not, if we're going to go the distance in our marriages, we need to understand this. We're going to face difficulties. We may fall down. We may trip up. Matter of fact, there's another verse in Proverbs 24. It says, if you fall to pieces in a crisis, there wasn't much to you in the first place. I know from time to time I use examples from the gym. Uh, and uh, there was a young, well, actually, he's a member here. I don't know if he's here today, Hector, Hector Giannis, so I'm just calling him out. Hopefully, he isn't too embarrassed. Uh, is Hector here? Hector, are you here? He's usually here. Where's Hector? Right there. There he is. All right. Uh, I didn't mean to embarrass you, brother, but this is a good story. Um, uh, they have another great testimony, Hector and, and, and Danielle. But anyway, I remember Hector was sparring a young guy at the gym. This is about two or three years ago. And... Three times this guy knocked Hector down in one three-minute round. Three times. Knocked him down to the mat. I don't know. I think you were there, coach. And the thing that that stands out in my mind is not that Big Josh knocked Hector down three times. You should have seen this guy. He, He got knocked down the first time. I mean, in a nanosecond, he was back up again. He got knocked all three times in the same round. That's a lot of times to get knocked down in one round, by the way. And so he got knocked down three. But that's not what stood out in my mind. When I think back on that situation, Hector, that's not the thing that stands out in my mind. The thing that stands out in my mind is you kept getting back up. I'm like, this guy is like the guy, the, we- the weebles. He wobbles, but they don't fall down. He just keeps getting up. And quite honestly, the verse that came to my mind watching him was Proverbs 24. The righteous may fall seven times, but they keep getting... This- guy just kept getting back up. Knocked down, get back up again. I thought, now that's what stood out of my mind. Not the fact that he got knocked down. It's the fact that he kept getting up. Because that's an example of godliness, right? There's something powerful about that. Let me just give you another example. Beethoven. Beethoven rewrote each piece of music he created at least a dozen times. Michelangelo made 2,000 preliminary drawings of The Last Judgment. Da Vinci worked on the Last Supper for more than 10 years. George Stevenson spent 15 years perfecting the locomotive. Mr. Field crossed the ocean 50 times before he successfully laid cable for, the tele- for telegraph communications. Westinghouse was considered crazy when he thought he could stop a train with wind. They thought he was crazy until he invented the air brakes. Hemingway rewrote the manuscript Old Man in the Sea at least 80 times. Will, William Wilberforce called a vote for the abolition of slavery every year for 16 years until he finally won enough votes. What if each one of those guys gave up? These are all examples, everybody, of things that changed our world. 
The things I just listed are things that brought life and hope or they represented beauty and inspiration beyond us. But here's the thing. They're all, they were all life-changing things that I mentioned, but none of those things came easy. And a marriage that's inspired by God, that represents God, that inspires others is never easy. The greatest things in life never come easy. There's always effort. So don't give up. Don't give up. Difficulty doesn't always translate into defeat. And here's the third and final thing. And this is so important. And that is this. We, when, when we do quit, and we have. Most of us have at, some, at something at some point in time. We often quit right before the victory. When we do quit, it's often right before the victory. When we give up, on that marriage, oftentimes, we were right, if we had just, if we had just got God in the middle of that thing, if we had just dug our heels in, if we just got a little godly, holy determination, we were right around, are you hearing me? Right around the corner from that thing changing. There's another scripture in Second Chronicles chapter 15, a new king by the name of Asa became the king and a prophet came to him and here's what he said to Asa, but as for you, and I think he's, God's saying this to us about our marriages, for some of us anyway. As for you, be strong, don't give up, for your work will be rewarded. Be strong, don't give up, for your work will be rewarded. Here's the background of that. King Asa is the new king. Israel had given up on God. They had gotten derailed in their relationship with him. They had started worshiping other gods, actually built idols representing these other gods that they began to worship. They forgot about God, the God that delivered them, okay? And so this went on for years. Now Asa is the king. And Asa says, all right, guys, this is not, this is not right at all. And so uh, the priests weren't reading the law and reading the word of God to the people, so the people weren't hearing it. Now there's two generations that, that had never even really heard who God was. So Asa rallied them all together. He says, first of all, I'm going to tear down all these foreign idols and foreign gods. We're not, we only have one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We have one God, the God who's delivered us from Egypt. We have one God, this great God. That's the God. We, so he tore down all the idols. He says, we're going to worship God. He reestablished worship to God. He told the priest, you better start breaking open the, 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 the book, the, the word of God, begin to read it. So he's doing all this and there's a revival now beginning to happen, but now there's resistance. There's pushback. There's difficulty. There's adversaries that are taking, uh, adversaries that are rising up. There, there's tough situations. They're going through a rough patch and Ace is not sure. He's tempted to give up and the prophet comes to him and says, here's what God says. Be strong. Do not give up. Your work will be rewarded. You are right around the corner from seeing a breakthrough, from seeing a victory. Don't stop. Most of the time when we quit, we were right there. We were about three feet away, folks. Just about three feet away. Matter of fact, in the mid-1800s, there was a man by the name of uh, R.U. Darby and his uncle. And they got, this, they got the gold fever, right? So they rush out to Colorado they're convinced they're going to strike it rich. After a few weeks uh, of, of kind of drilling and mining, they discovered, a, uh, um, they discovered an, uh, a, a, an ore of gold. Uh, and so they got their money together. They bought what they needed to, to drill down even further. The first car of ore that was mined, they shipped it to a smelter. And what they suspected was true. They had discovered one of the richest gold mines in Colorado. So man, they were pumped. They started drilling feverishly. But then something weird happened. The vein of gold ore disappeared. They drilled on desperately. Kept drilling further and further. They could not, after many attempts, several, multiple attempts, they couldn't pick up that vein of gold ore again and so they got discouraged they quit they sold their machinery for just a half of what they paid for it to uh, a junk man guy that just collected that kind of stuff for a few hundred dollars sold it to this guy well what this guy did is he 
He went and got a mining engineer to look into the mine and do some calculations. And the engineer came back and he told them, he says, the reason why these other guys failed is because they weren't familiar with the fault lines that run through this mine. And his calculations showed them that the vein of gold ore that they were looking for, the mother load, was only three feet from where they stopped drilling. And so this guy that got the mining equipment for a few hundred dollars went ahead and drilled three feet further in the right direction and pulled up millions and millions of dollars of gold back in the 1800s. Here's what I'm trying to say. You and I feel like we're drilling down. We're trying to do our best. It seems like whatever kept us together, what caused us to be in love with each other, that vein has somehow disappeared. We've been drilling, trying to find it, maybe doing it on our own, maybe doing it on our own strength, maybe doing all the right things, but we're running out of steam and we give up about three feet away from that breakthrough that we need in our marriage. And I'm telling some of you here, you're only about three feet away from victory in your marriage don't stop now don't give up on God don't give up on your spouse don't give up on your marriage just don't give up that's not an option for you are you hearing what I'm saying yes or no it's not an option just drill a little bit further how much longer I don't know but I'm, I'll tell you this our God's a God of total victory so there's always victory the devil is the God of defeat. Our God is a God of victory. The devil, is the, the devil is the creator and the originator of disaster. Our God is a God of redemption and hope and life. The devil is the God of death. Our God is the God of life. There's no losing with God. We put him in the center. We keep drilling down, ladies and gentlemen. Your marriage is guaranteed to hit that vein of gold, that treasure of God's life and love in your marriage again if you'll just not quit. Let's go the distance, man. It's not an option, right? It's not an option. Let's bow our heads if we could. And as we do, I'm going to ask our prayer teams if they would make their way up. They're here to pray for you for anything that you might need. Uh, if you're new here, if you're visiting for the first time, that's why these folks are here. So after we dismiss in privacy, if you want to come up and pray with them about anything, your marriage, your life, any burden or anything hairy that, he, heavy that you're carrying, they're here uh, to help you. But I want to pray for you as we, as we close out this morning. And listen with our heads bowed there might be there might be some folks here where your marriage is shaky it's rough maybe you felt like you're running out of steam and you're tempted to throw in the towel all I'm saying is you're just about three feet away man don't quit so Father in the name of Jesus you know our hearts you know where we're at I just pray in Jesus name that you administer your grace your strength your, your, your life right now especially those who might be struggling in their marriages and so Father may we never delete you out of the equation of our marriages we may think we have it added up and figured up as to what's going to happen but oftentimes we're using an equation that doesn't involve you May we not factor you out. Because what seems impossible with man is always possible with you. You are the one that can make it right even when there's no one on the planet that can fix it. You're the one that can. There's something supernatural that happens, Lord, when we just choose not to quit and trust you and go one more step, a few more feet, so, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would breathe hope into the hearts of your people this morning. We thank you, God, that you didn't give up on us, and you don't. We thank you, Jesus, you didn't quit on your way to the cross. And we thank you that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in us than all the doubts and fears that have ruled us in the past. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said...
Amen. Can we thank God for his word one more time, everybody?